we can see all these familiar names and faces in the room. Thanks for coming. Wonderful. Over to you, Zena. So really um, simple agenda today. You're going to meet us, uh, for those that don't know us already. Uh, we're going to share the niche on demand vision and journey and take you through that. And then we're going to step through the niche on demand crowdfunding, the announcement that we made uh, about three weeks ago now, three to four weeks ago now, and then talk to you about how you can get involved. So very simple for, for tonight. So this is the vision. This is who we are. We were founded in 2018 and we have evolved into a virtual studio. And what does that actually mean? Like how do we evolve into a virtual studio? When we first started, Dina and I, we were both consultants at EY. We knew that we wanted to tell stories. At first we thought we wanted to tell those stories as a production company. And then quickly found out, mm, not so much, not our strength. We respect production companies. We respect what they do, but it was important for us to stay in our lane and stay in the lane of where our strengths are, which is to look at creatives, connect creatives to business individuals, to investors, to commissioners, to studios who want their stories told. And that's where we devised our plan to come up with and raise a hundred million. Zina, Zina? Yeah, so we like audacious, foundacious goals. So, um, and coming from a management consulting and business background, we know what it takes to make this type of vision possible, um, especially when you're paying people equitably. And so seeing how the marketplace was shifting, seeing how audiences were accessing content and there was more of a direct to consumer model, we thought there's a great opportunity for us to build strategic partnerships with creatives and use our business knowledge to be able to create platforms and relationships where we will be able to support creatives to get their stories written, produced, directed, and marketed. Um, and we have access to a global network, so we know that this talent exists, and we know that there's a demand for its audiences. And there you are. That's how the Niche on Demand vision came to life. Now, is that something out of the ordinary? No, is actually the new normal. We see Black women in positions of leadership, whether it be in politics, whether it's film, <laughs> whether it's transitioning from politics to creativity in the case of Michelle Obama or with the relationships that Ava DuVernay and Oprah Winfrey has. So there were key trends that we were both seeing that really impacted us and our in the future in terms of what niche on demand could potentially be. The first is what we call the matrix. The matrix, stepping out of institutional systems and really looking at technology playing a key role and a key driver to success in terms of creatives. And with the rise of TikTok, we see a lot of digital content creators doing pretty <laughs> just a minute to 60 seconds. Of course, we have YouTube, which really sort of democratize how people consume content. I was one of the people, I'm not sure about you, but I was one of the many watching Blue Therapy over the past Summer really engaged with Blue Therapy, and that came up on YouTube before we were driven to their, their streaming platform. So the Matrix is really about technology, how we use technology to tell our stories, and how we as Niche On Demand use technology to enable Black creativity. So that was one of the key trends that we started to see, and we thought well, actually we need to really embed it in the heart of what we do as a virtual studio. So the second trend, um, hidden talent. Uh, we've been having these conversations in our corporate lives um, and in our creative lives in terms of people asking us where, where can we find black talent that are able to fulfill these roles um, and help us to increase diversity and inclusiveness across the industry. What we recognize is that the talent isn't hidden. It just depends where you are in terms of your network and how you're networked. So one of the things we wanted to make sure was that um, we were able to create uh, networks and relationships so that we could create uh, the ability to um, unhide this talent that, it, that is said to be hidden. So, so I'm just reading one of the comments. Well, we'll turn our volume up so that you can hear it. Thanks for the comment. Um, 
we have also been involved in our corporatizing diversity and inclusiveness programs as well. And the conversation about the war on talent and where you can find talent is always a, a key topic of discussion. Um, and working within this space and speaking to creatives, we recognize, as I mentioned, that it's not that the talent's hidden, it's just about expanding those networks and creating those bridges so that people know where to find uh, talent that they're looking for. Uh let me just recap in terms of the matrix for those who may have missed it. That was really about the digital revolution and using technology as the tool to enable black storytelling. So that is what we call the matrix. Now in terms of mind versus machine, what that trend was about is what I alluded to earlier in terms of making sure that when we start to think about this new way of doing things, there is a new way to and so yes, there are the machines that exist. There are, is the way that Hollywood has always done things. The film industry has always done things. But we see this new rise of creativity with people saying, actually, I wanna tell my story authentically this way. I think there is a, a market, there is a niche for the stories that I want to speak to and the stories that I have. And therefore I wanna go against the machine and really cater to a niche audience, it's very niche, very specific a deep focus. We saw that the most popular example, not the most, but one of the most popular examples is Jordan Peele when he did, when he started just looking at black thriller in a very specific way. And so those are the three key trends that we started to see, making sure that we had collective minds interested in what we are trying to do and then moving forward with that collective interest. And so then that brings us to then the niche on demand state of mind. Now, Zena and I have a founders podcast and we talk about different insights, et cetera. And one of the podcasts that we'll be introducing shortly is the niche on demand state of mind. And what do we mean by that? It's actually the last thing that I just said. It is about creating space, about being emotionally intelligent, being respectful, value space operating very simply when it comes to relationships, collaborations, access, and power. Zena? In order to create a new business model, in order to break cycles and do things in a different way, as Sabrina said, a lot of the stuff we're doing isn't revolutionary, but one of the key things is about creating a culture of engagement with creatives and creating a different way of being. And one of those things is about how we fund our creatives in a, a culturally intelligent and competent way um, that is equitable um, and also recognizes that um, experience is developed not always just in the industry, in various other um, uh, experiences that people bring to the creative industry. And sometimes the challenge of getting industry into the industry can take longer for diverse professionals, diverse creatives. Um, so when we look at people like, um, James Samuels, who's been working on, um, what's the name of the film that's on Netflix? Why is that just escaped my, The Harder They Fall. That has been a 20 year, yeah, Harder Fall, that's been a 20 year vision that he's been able to achieve recently. Has, has anybody seen that film? It was a phenomenal film. Um, we also want to talk about how modeling equitable relationships um, are key to building a different culture. So we've heard lots of stories where uh, creatives have not had equitable deals and talking to many of the creators we work with and also dealing with the industry we found that there is starting to be a shift where people are recognizing how creators are bringing their own audiences uh, to projects and finding alternative ways in which we're trying to support getting development funds which puts them in a more a powerful position to negotiate more equitable deals. Um, authentic storytelling the stories that are told will be determined by people feeling empowered to tell their real authentic stories. Um, and often in a system which dictates how black stories and black people show up, uh, people aren't often empowered to tell those stories in an authentic way. And tuning into people's sonic vibrations is just about vibes. Creativity is about collaboration. It's about getting to the heart of the, the art. And so we want to create an environment where it enables creativity in its truest sense. So the three ways that we do that, one is breaking the cycles, uh, recognizing which 
cycle, which patterns of behavior are conducive to supporting black creatives um, and working to create a culture through the niche on the demand state of mind and setting example in terms of the way we work with the industry and creatives to break some of those cycles that haven't been helpful to support creatives in the past. And the second way we do that is what brought Zine and I together is telling stories. Everything starts with the story. And one of the things that we committed to is it doesn't have to be a well developed finely crafted, shiny story. So long as the creative either has the concept, understands what they want to tell, want to tell the story, think that there is a market, then we have a conversation with that creative. It's very important that we amplify our stories and we show the diversity of Black stories whether it's a Black Western, which is what Zena referenced earlier, if it's a thriller, if it's a documentary, if it's a legacy piece, whatever it is that we amplify those diverse stories within our community. And part of the ability to break cycles and, and uphold these narratives is finding ways to preserve this history. So you'll hear later on how we work with archiving organizations like the Black Cultural Archive to make sure that there's home for these stories and this content to be captured. We're really excited to see that the managing director of the Black Culture Archives, Arike Oke, um, or the previous managing director has now moved to the BFI. Um, and so the ability to have that type of archiving knowledge at places like the British Film Institute are really important to be able to uh, make sure that our histories are preserved. Walter Mosley, um, the author that you may be uh, aware of, had also said that um, in order for people's history to be retained, it has to be told in fiction. Um, and that's a lot of the time how our oral histories are retained when they are told through creative stories. So it's very important for us to find ways to do that using creativity, storytelling, and supporting that creatives. So you've heard about our vision, you know how we met, you found out about who we are, how we do things, so what have we been doing since 2018? The first thing is we founded. We, we founded in 2018. I'm based in London and Zena based in uh, the Cayman Islands. And being founded in 2018 may sound like small. Oh, you just started. Actually, it's quite. it was quite a significant step for the both of us to, to think about actually coming together and formalizing something that we discussed organically. So we started in 2018. Yeah. And this has been a vision for Sabrina and I individually and various many very different ways. Uh, we have our own separate companies. And I know we both have talked about incorporating a way to support creatives and be involved in the creative industry independently. So it was a kind of perfect coming together to create Niche On Demand. And in 2019, we had the opportunity to do one of the first kind of major events together, which was the American Black Film Festival in London. So working with the American Black Film Festival, which was established 25 years ago, they're currently running now. Um, and we helped to produce their first event in London, which was a great example of how the global diaspora can work together. And there was a marketplace for black stories uh, across the world. We also were fortunate enough to work with the Cold Social magazine, which is a magazine that has been created to represent diverse voices. It's the first of its kind uh, based in London. And we worked with the editor who, thank you, joined the call today um, to help to uh, kickstart uh, the Cold Social. And Zena's not going to say it, but I will. Zena has an article coming out in the Cold Social. So make sure you go and uh, read and grab it in the next issue, I believe. Um, and then in 2020, we were the commercial agents for the Black Cultural Archives. Now, what does the commercial agents of the Black Cultural Archives have anything to do with a virtual studio? Two things. Number one, um, as we mentioned earlier, preserving legacy and history is extremely important and centered to our business. And in the United Kingdom, the Black Cultural Archives is the epicenter to that. So the ability for us to use our skills to support the Black Cultural Archives was something that we were both it was just an easy, easy yes for us, for us to do. Along that journey though, of course, there were opportunities that came about that was mutually beneficial. We collaborated on doing a, a series uh, about marketing 
looking at the late and the great, uh, actually Glenn Yearwood, who now has passed away, but was alive at that time. Albert, I think is on the call who supported that project. Um, there were a lot of great things that we did. Uh, one of the biggest actually donations that came to the Black Cultural Archives was facilitated by us. So something that we were very proud of. And Zena, you mentioned uh, Arike OK earlier. Do you want to expand on that relationship? Yeah, so we got involved with Arike um, as they were going through the process of reimagining the Black Cultural Archive. And Sabrina facilitated the town hall where we helped to reintroduce the BCA and its new 2030 strategy. So that's where the relationship started and the, the journey um, started in terms of us forming a commercial relationship with the BCA. So um, as Sabrina said, one of the biggest wins was working to help to secure funding from Warner Music Group um, and also putting in place a number of um, processes to support the Black Cultural Archive to be able to um, benefit from its assets by working equitably with corporate commercial organizations. And now you remember this is in the 2020 Black Circle. So we knew what was happening around the world in 2020. Unfortunately, the murder of George Floyd occurred at that time. And there was lots of protests, lots of angst, lots of anger, mm -hmm. lots of expression from Black creatives, from corporates, uh, not corporates, corporates with their Instagram posts, um, from Black people in corporates uh, who were just really bewildered, depressed, angry, a range of emotions uh, because of 2020. And from that, born one of the relationships, born out of actually one of the relationships that we have with one of, the, with one of our strategic partners, Talia Bloom, um, Boone was a, a an event at Ken Lyons. Your Instagram posts won't save lives. Do something, damn it. Zena, do you want to share more information about that? Sure. So it was at a time where it was important that we uh, supported one of our strategic partners to um, get the message out in a way that was meaningful and on a platform that would get global reach. Um, she... Talia Boone is um, very active in the social activist, activism space and had a relationship with a number of um, uh, sports uh, professionals and also Benjamin Crump. Um, and it, it was key to start a conversation around how do you start to engage in this discussion in a way that's not performative, in a way that can support meaningful change and a way that gets to the heart of what does um, real action look like um, and that discussion was facilitated through this. So if you haven't had a chance to see the Can Line activation, it should still be on the platform. So please check it out. It's also on our YouTube channel. So you can check that out there. Did you mention it was top 10? It was top, yeah, it was the top 10 activation for that year, which was incredible because this was Talia Boone, one of our strategic partners, first um, uh, Can Lion activations. So again, this conversation about hidden talent, the talent's there. It's just sometimes it's not in the networks that um, are traditionally used to create these types of content, this type of content. Okay, so that is our origin story. That is what we've been doing since 2018. And now we're in 2021 and we have officially launched our crowdfunding platform, which we are both very proud of. The numbers have always spoken for themselves. We're not going to pretend today that there isn't buying power that the Black consumer does not consume. And people who aren't Black just interested in Black stories because true storytelling resonates universally. And so with the launch of the crowdfunding platform, we are able to enable creative storytelling. With your support, of course, be able to bring certain stories to life. We're looking at 1.5 trillion, just in terms of projected um, financial power from the Black community alone in the States, not around the world. So just think about what that would mean if we just took 100 million of that and put it towards niche on demand, which is our, our goal, or $28,000 uh, of that and put it towards one of our creatives, which you'll hear about later. So that is the big milestone for 2021 is launching the crowdfunding platform. So what does our ecosystem look like to do this? Uh, it, as we said in our nation demand state of mind, we try to keep things as simply as simple as possible. 
So don't let this diagram fool you. Um, it, it starts with the stories. It starts with um, meeting creatives, meeting strategic partners, if I can get the words out, who have a story to tell, who want to share a message, who want their authentic uh, stories told in, in the public space. Um, and we work with them uh, to help them with their IP, with their brand, and also identify the right production partners. And then we break cycles by doing what? Executive producing, uh, making sure that we give the creatives, the, our strategic partners, the time to do what they do best, which is create. And we focus on brokering, negotiating, managing those deals, having investor conversations, having distribution conversations, looking at partners that make sense for our strategic partners or niche on demand as a whole and doing so equitably. And as we talked about earlier, we want to preserve these legacies and these stories. So we work with archiving partners like the Black Cultural Archive and the Robert Sensdak Abbott Foundation that's based in Chicago um, and a number of other um, organizations that are committed to preserving stories and legacy and making space um, for this content to exist. And then Zena and I both have the honor and privilege to be on the board of Theatre 503. We are very much committed to emerging writers, emerging talent. And one of the things we found like in every corporate environment, there's a gateway. <laughs> is absolutely one of the places that's <coughs> just to, just to, to success in film. We have writers <laughs> who are now writing for The Crown, writing for all these various um, you know, blockbuster places. And they started at Theatre 503. Tori Hall started at Theatre 503. Yasmin Joseph, who had her play Juve. I had the chance to see it. I know I did. I absolutely loved it. People who know me well know I don't leave my house for anything. I left <laughs> COVID when there was no carnival with my mask on to go and support and see Juve in the theatre, which was absolutely amazing to see live. So you have so many individuals like the Yasmin Josephs, the Tory Halls, and etc. coming out of Theatre 503. Um, amazing writers coming out of that theatre. And we are there to just to guide um, and support such an amazing platform and future writers and, as well. I'm not sure if I'm hearing background noise. Somebody might be on off mute. I can ask whoever to go on mute. Thank you very much. So you heard from us. Now it's time to hear from some of the three creatives actually that is on our panel. So Marie James, um, she's a creative who's been in the industry for uh, over 15 years and has a breadth of experience from online producing to writing and also being nominated um, and shortlisted for a number of writers programs. She has a, an amazing story, which she has optioned the book for, and it's about a, an alternative story to um, the Jamaican revolution. Um, so I won't do it as much justice as Marie will, so we'll play the video so she can tell you about the story herself. I'm Marie James, screenwriter of the Jamaicans, and I'm here to tell you about the film how it originated and why it's an important story for worldwide audiences. The Jamaicans is an action drama depicting the 1655 English invasion of Jamaica and the five-year war of resistance that followed. This war pit military heavyweights against people whose only advantages were stealth, familiarity with the land and a determination not to be enslaved. What we witness is guerrilla war and the true story of Jamaica's most formidable fighters, Juan de Bola and Juan Serras, and the people living in the stronghold and farm they led. This is a complex and emotional tale of friendship, love, family, and a community torn apart by death and divided loyalties. This five-year battle for freedom ended after one of the two men made a decision that split Jamaica forever. As a child, I never visited Jamaica. My familiarity with the land of my parents was fed through traditions, food, and conversation. 
And in school, all I was taught is that Jamaicans and Africans were passive, uncivilized people who succumbed with smiles to their natural superiors. I grew up in Bristol, UK, the city made rich by slavery and infamous after the 2020s toppling of Edward Colston's statue, just one wealthy slave merchant. I witnessed the statue fall with a mix of fear and awe because Bristol's history labels prominent streets from White Ladies Road to Black Boy Hill. And this statue was toppled and thrown in the river during a protest triggered by George, George Floyd's murder at the hands of police officers. What makes this story important is that too much world history is taught from an English perspective and they actively suppress the truth. Like stolen wealth, hidden history is an oppressive force that wields power. I discovered Jamaica's true history in my 20s when I found Victor Stafford Reed's 1976 novel, The Jamaicans, in a junk store. Finding this book took me on my first journey to Jamaica when the British Council contracted me to write an article about the author for their magazine. But this journey deserves to end with the film. In Jamaica, I visited Wandabola Mountain in St. Catherine, a place where his reputation as hero and traitor remains today. Wandabola stopped the war by becoming an English ally. The English crowned him a colonel and in return, his people received land and, and freedom to farm. But all Juan Saras saw was a sellout and he killed him as soon as he could track Wonderbola down. Those who refused to join the English fled to the hills and mountains of Jamaica and these people are the Maroon ancestors. And today the Maroons have their own land and independent seats in Jamaican government but still Almost 400 years later, the fight to bring the Maroons in line continues. When I left Jamaica, I carried an option to develop Victor Stafford Reed's book into a film. After too long spent trying to find writers who could do it justice, a UK film producer read my outline and said, I'm sure you could just do it yourself. My first draft was shortlisted for the 2018 screen Sundance Screen Lab. The script is much better now, but with development finance in place, I guarantee we'll secure investment to make the Jamaicans the film for real. So that, that was Marie James. Um, we have, we're really grateful actually for these creatives coming on board because this is a new idea. So they're as much in the sandbox of development for this crowdfunding piece as we are. So. For them to be the first, um, it's a great testimony to their um, support of what we're doing. Um, and um, we also wanted to make sure that we had a cross-section in terms of intergenerational creatives. So Terry Jervis is, some of you may know him, and he will tell you a bit more about himself and his, ex his past experiences. But he has been in the industry for over 40 years. And a, a little known fact is, that Terry was one of the key people in breaking hip hop and uh, making hip hop go global by putting it on a number of the shows that he produced back in the early 90s uh, and building relationships with the hip hop artists when mainstream didn't want to play them. But he had a, he has an idea that he's been developing over the last few years called The Spirit of the Pharaoh, which is based on a graphic novel. Um, and he will tell you a bit more about it. Hello, my name is Terry Jervis. Some of you may know some of the things I've produced, directed, or been involved with. Such as TV shows, radio, comic books, entertainment, music, comedy, and sport. With over 40 years in entertainment and business, from Hollywood to London, I have trained and mentored a range of talent across the board, but also emphasizing black people's contributions to the world through documentaries and historical events. My shows and media have been watched and listened to by over 4.2 billion people worldwide. You can read my short bio or search my name to find out more. My career started in publishing at 12 years old, in comic books to be precise. You might laugh, but that's what got me into TV and is an integral part 
of the secret of my success. Today, comic books fuel a multi-billion dollar entertainment and merchandising economy, with names like Marvel and DC at the top. I have a tried and tested book, which is selling well, called Spirit of the Pharaoh. This book is called a graphic novel, which is essentially a movie script and storyboard combined, which is what we work with to make movies and TV shows and even theatre. In 2017, Spirit of the Pharaoh was developed into a graphic novel in collaboration with Marvel Comics' Spider-Man, X-Men and Transformers franchise writer Simon Furman. And also Stan Berkowitz, writer of DC Comics, Batman, Superman and Wonder Woman animated movies. Spirit of the Pharaoh is an unforgettable romance set between the ancient land of the pharaohs and the present day. It has everything to capture the imagination. A thrilling story that bursts into life with an ancient tomb, villains and heroes, a quest for eternal life, gold and jewellery which harness immense powers, and an underlying plot of hope against all odds. This is a story. Two warring spirits are loose on the world after a tomb is unearthed. Seth, the ancient Egyptian god of chaos, and King Ramun, a pharaoh sworn to protect his people and reunite with his long-lost love, Queen Nefakari. When Seth forms an unholy alliance with a billionaire arms dealer who wants the golden unk and the secret of the afterlife, an ability to live forever, it is up to Ramun, with the help of a modern-day young couple, Raymond and Marie, who inherit ancient superpowers to defeat the god of chaos once and for all. The new technique of making blockbuster stories on a fraction of the price of a normal Hollywood movie is what I specialize in. But this can bring the same high-earning economic results and will be perfect for streaming services such as the likes of Netflix and Amazon, but will also build an entire franchise of toys, games, hair and beauty products, clothing and many more forms of merchandising. Remember, before Wakanda and Black Panther, Stargate and Star Wars, there was ancient Egypt. Their technology, achievements, spirituality and legacy inspires to this day and continues to mystify and resonate with people around the world. This is why my film, Spirit of the Pharaoh, will captivate you. Thank you for listening. Okay, well thank you for the comment. You love it, you're sold. Fantastic. I want to make sure, can you hear me? I want to do Kenzo justice. Yes, if you could type yes in the- Yep, I can hear um, you loud and clear. Wonderful, thank you. So I want to make sure that uh, everybody can hear me clearly as I introduce Kenzo. So uh, I want you to uh, imagine a world where African horror stories come to life, where we're not only talking about Jordan Peele, but we have an individual who can bring some of the stories that we grew up with to life on film. That is Kenzo Ogbolu, whose series Freak the F Out um, comes to life in an animated and live series way. And so Freak the F Out or FTFO, which is how I'm going to refer to it, for the next couple of seconds, has been running now for five seasons. It started as a, an animated series, has now progressed to a live action series. And so Kanzo Apollo, who is our strategic partner, is who is seeking funding and whose video you are going to watch now. Hi, my name is Kanzo Ogulu. I'm an illustrator, animator, and a filmmaker. I'm here to talk to you today about a project that is really dear to me. It's titled FTFO, which stands for Freak the F Out. 
Now, Flick the F Out or FTFO is an anthology series uh, currently in its fifth season. It's a horror anthology series that brings to life a lot of uh, Nigerian, African, and sometimes foreign myths that we grew up with. We're talking about the Madame Koi Koi's, the Bush Babies, Dark Man, you know, putting, um, dropping food on the floor and the devil picking up. You know, we just try to make stories around uh, these mythologies. Now, it started out in 2017 as an animated series about one minute for each episode um, and 13 episodes per season. Uh, sometime, I think, in the third season, I was able to make the episodes longer. And now, currently in its fifth season, it ha has evolved into a live action series. Each episode being about three to five minutes. Now, this video seeks to um, ask for funding because I would love to see this series that I have pretty much treated like my baby and done by myself, funded by myself and all that. I'd love to see it evolve into something even bigger, the likes of, say, American Horror Stories, where each episode is 30 to 50 minutes and you have 8 to 13 episodes per season of adapted and original African horror stories. You know, we bring some of these stories that we went to school with uh, to life. The, the, all the boarding school chronicles, all of that horror bush baby story. We bring it to life. We, we, we write rich stories around all of these myths and try, seek to bring them to life. And then just have a beautiful, authentic African horror series that, you know, can compete with the likes of your American Horror Stories, your Fear, Fear Street, and, and all the other um, wonderfully made horror anthologies. Thank you. Exactly that, <laughs> exactly that, Conley. I see you um, uh, in the in the chat as I'm turning on my video. My 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 video turning is slightly delayed. Uh, yes, I have those stories. I'm um, I'm also a Liberian heritage, and we have mommy water stories as well uh, in terms of the sirens. So lots of stories that we can see come to come to life. And so you've seen the diversity of our three. Uh, our three strategic partners, our three creatives. Uh, Marie, looking at the Jamaicans, Marie James, Terry Jervis, looking at Spirit of the Pharaoh, and finally, Kenzo Ogbolu, uh, looking at an African horror anthology series. Very diverse. All three projects we both strongly believe should have a place in Black storytelling, and that's why they're on our platform. Now, along with those stories, if you thought to yourself, well, actually, I want to support all three. I can't choose between which one. Then you have the option of supporting us, our vision, and each on demand. And what we want to do for 2021 is to raise 250,000 pounds. What we will do with that is reinvest it back into those stories that you've seen and other creatives. Like we should have mentioned, actually, those three strategic partners aren't the only strategic partners that we work with. They just happen to be the partners that we're highlighting for this funding round. And we will have other funding rounds um, when we formally, if you will, quotations launch next year. But we have a number of other strategic partners that, that we work with. And to date, with under 100,000, Zina and I have reinvested back into Niche on Demand to support a lot of the things that you've seen already. And so if you like those stories, can't decide between which one, want to support all of it, then you have uh, the vision, our vision that you can help us support and invest in to be able to see those stories come to life. Zena, was there anything you wanted to 
Look, are you going to say something? No, no. I'm, okay. And you said everything we need to say. Okay. So it's the, the way to get involved, as Sabrina has mentioned, is, is really simple. Uh, if you go to the site, you'll see there's the ability to back uh, the campaigns. Um, so you can back each individual campaign, or all of them, or you can support the vision. And when you think about what the cost of that is, if you think about the money you spent on the guitar that you were going to learn during the pandemic, uh, raise your hand if you bought something during the pandemic because you thought you were going to learn that skill and it's sitting there collecting dust in the corner. Um, to be fair, I brought it before. I bought it before the pandemic. Okay, well, well, I wasn't I trying to I, I, shade, <laughs> put shade on you. Sabrina, I'm going to shade myself. I'm, I'm people. <laughs> I, I, I'm people. <laughs> Yeah, roller, I see rollerblades, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. So um, the principle is that um, it's about the collective. Um, as we mentioned earlier on, um, the increasing um, economic power of the global diaspora, as well as supporters of Black stories, um, means that there is the ability for us to take $10, the cost of a sneak pair of sneakers, the cost of that guitar or those rollerblades and support the next generations of creatives to get these stories told, um, which has a massive impact on the economy and the ability to create jobs and opportunities for people, not just in the creative industry, but in the wider industries as well. Cost of your Starbucks, cost of uh, your Amazon Prime delivery, not subscription, because I love my subscription as well, but your delivery or a pair of shoes, all of that can go towards investing in and seeing our stories told as Zena mentioned. So we will be sharing the links uh, in the chat now as we open the conversation up for some questions uh, and answers. We want to say we have the next you know 10 minutes or so to to answer questions and thank you so much for joining us and joining our conversation today. Um, so let's if you have any questions, you can come off, raise your hand so we can see you and you can come off mute. Um, Uchechi, uh, yeah, so the way that we operate mm -hmm. and the reason why we're not putting all of our strategic partners out yet and voting on that is because every strategic partner doesn't have the same uh, go to market strategy in terms of going to market. So crowdfunding is for um, specific strategic partners projects. Not all of our strategic partners are comfortable with that being the method for which they want to see their arts um, told. And so there are some strategic partners that we work with, but we are taking the more traditional route um, in speaking to relationships with studios and commissioners to see that story told. And there are some strategic partners, the three that you've seen, um, and we'll continue to see others who lend their projects more to a crowdfunding format, which is why not every single uh, project in our portfolio will be up uh, on the website for public vote. I hope that answers your your question. Any question, other questions, comments? Zina, do you want to take that one? Will we have access to the recorded materials so as to go over them again? Yes, you will. We will be putting that up on our YouTube channel, so you will be able to get access to um, the recording of this event, and also the uh, creatives are on the Niche On Demand site. So I'll put them in the chat as well. Um, but if you go to the Niche On Demand site and click on Fun Creatives, that will be, you'll find those videos there as well. Uh, just popped the Niche On Demand site in the chat for you, and also we'll be popping Fun The Creatives in the chat for you just as, as well to make it easy to find. Oh, you're taking it easy on us. No, no questions. Did we answer all of your questions? What about comments? What are your thoughts? There's a lot of information to take in. What are your initial reactions? So a quick question, if I may say, I'm not good at typing on my iPad. Um, yes. Is there, is there anything we can do to help you promote this, perhaps to our networks or, or sort of the wider community? Thanks for joining, Like a Yes. Um, yeah. Share, share, share. So the, the websites that I've just put in the, in the chat, please share. If you haven't followed Niche On Demand on LinkedIn yet, please follow us. Uh, we post everything there as well as on Instagram at, at Black Nod on Instagram, Niche On Demand on LinkedIn. And I'll put that link in 
the chat as well. Um, advocacy, share, share, discuss, talk. That's what we, that's what you can do to help us. Zena? I see a couple more questions. Thanks for that question um, in the chat. Um, so the question is, are there shares being offered by the platform like CrowdKeep? So at this stage, we are having private conversations offline for people interested in um, the proposition of niche on demand and investing in the specific projects that are shared. But via the platform at the moment, the conversation is really just about supporting these projects to, to, um, to happen. Uh, and for that, there are listed the various different benefits in terms of getting producer credits depending on the level that you're willing to invest. Um, but we are open to have conversations offline if people are interested in investing directly into these projects. Uh, but just to to clarify, currently the the equity in the projects isn't offered on the platform. So if you go to a crowd coup right now, a Cedars, etc., you will see that on the platform. So just want, just want to clarify that it's not um, what you're doing. As you said, when you go on the platform, you see the the various options. Great. Any other comments? Hi, Just can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, Kwame. Hey, how are you? Firstly, thank you so much. This is incredible. Um, I just had a thought that this might tap into a lot of um, corporation CSR initiatives um, as a maybe a quick way to support something doing great things. And it might be um, it might be something to have like a one pager to present to any um, decision makers that we're all involved in, maybe. Yeah, so are you asking, um, can we provide a one pager? The, the short answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can, we have, yes, we can absolutely do that. No problem, um, and we can make that available. Thanks. Plus one to the one pager, thank you, Joe. We will take Thanks. a note of that and make sure you get that as well. Thanks, Ken. Great, okay, you are all very quiet. Any other comments? I'm interested just in your reactions. Thumbs up, thumbs down, claps, what do you think? We, we also like interested in what doesn't work, uh, if there were things that didn't work for you or you'd like to see, we'd love to hear that too. How can creatives submit projects for considerations? Zena, do you wanna take that one? Um, as we said in our niche on demand state of mind, we like to keep things operationally simple. Send us an email um, and um, we will have a conversation. And if it's something that there's alignment with, um, we will explore being a strategic partner to help you get the project made. And the email address is hello at nicheondemand.com. Hi, good evening. Zena, Sabrina, hope you're both well. Yeah, thank oh, you. good to see you. Hey, and hi to everyone else. Um, quite a straightforward question, actually. I know you're, you're um, specialising in the production space in terms of um, linking people's ideas um, with production houses or investment. But are you thinking to grow beyond film, television, animation in terms of businesses um, and other creative spaces as well, going into music, for example? You know, I, I'm smiling uh, because Zena knows uh, the passion and love affair I have with music. Uh, right now, the focus is to focus on audio, film, theater content. Um, music will always be the soundtrack that goes behind everything that we do. Whether or not that gets expanded into an actual proposition, it's not something that we've discussed, never say never. Should I answer your question? Spot on. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think I saw a question about, is there a contingency plan if the funding goal uh, is not met? Yes. We all, we, so to be clear, we are always and continue to explore other funding routes. This is just one of multiple strategies we currently have. And so if for whatever reason, this crowdfunding approach doesn't work for these projects, we will continue to pursue and focus on the funding routes that we're currently pursuing. 
So this is just an addition to the portfolio, not the only thing in the arsenal. And just respond to, I see a comment from Jay, film needs music. You're right, we're working on a project right now with uh, a partner who's on the call, um, who is a musician and an editor um, who has been composing pieces for our short film, um, as well as us using um, music that currently exists as well. So you can't separate the connection between the two. So it's only a matter of time, I feel. Maybe, but just to be clear, I'm, I'm not right now thinking about being a, a Puffy or Sean Puffy Combs or... No. Or, or, we, 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 were we thinking or, about being executive Barry producers Gordy. when we were at Ernst & Young at that moment in time? Yeah, so. I mean, well, maybe in Idris, because Idris is both, he's doing both, isn't he? So you yeah, never know. True. Never, never say never. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, we, I do have one more question. Yes. Um, and it's regarding, um, let's say, for example, one of the projects you've highlighted um doesn't receive funding does the idea stay with you or can they then take that idea and go if let's say after a couple of years they've not had success unfortunately what happens then going forward does the ip stay with you or oh so yeah so let, let's clarify that very important point uh, we do not own the ip of our creatives our creatives own their ip we don't have an exclusive relationship with our creatives our partnership is non-exclusive. So our work with them is to make sure that it benefits them. We're not gonna hoard their creativity at all. Uh, this is one of many options that they have. While we are working with them, if there's another opportunity to get their project funded, absolutely, they should get their project funded. That's, that's the purpose. That's how we work. And that's what makes us very different, as you know, <laughs> of how things are currently done and usually done. Yeah, and our podcast that should be coming out soon, which talks about our niche on demand state of mind, articulates the fact that our working principles are really values based um, and it's the integrity of the relationships. Um, and the aim is for us to add so much value to the relationship that there wouldn't be any reason for the creative to want to leave. But if it makes more sense, as Karina said, um, we are about the art being out there and the art happening and there being equitable um, relationships for black artists and creators in a way that hasn't existed before. So we're not going to be part of the problem. We're always going to be part of that solution. And with that, we want to honor everyone's time. As we said, we'll be done by eight or three or four, wherever you are in the world, we are at time. So thank you very much for joining our first town hall. Uh, we will communicate with you often. The key thing is we need your support. We've put the links in the bio, uh, in the chat, excuse me, for you to go explore, see, share. We will do a one pager and have that available actually on the site. So it's easy and we'll post about that. So uh, I think it was Kwame who asked and Joe who asked um, for it. Um, so you can, you can see and others who want to to see it, can use it and share it internally. And of course, for a tenor, you can support a creative. <laughs> so thank you very much. Zena, final words? Um, thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. None of this is possible without you engaging and having a conversation and sharing. So you appreciate it. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, we are done. We're gonna hang around a little bit. <laughs> so if there are still some lingering people, we're here. But in terms of honoring everybody else's time, thank you very much. The main presentation is now closed. Enjoy your day, afternoons, mornings, wherever you are in the world. We're gonna hang around just for a couple more minutes, uh, just in case you have any more questions and then we'll close. Thank you very much, Sabina. Thanks, Zina. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. Thanks, 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 Marcia. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Elisa. Thanks, thanks, Alicia. Thanks, Sarita. Hey, Sarita, fellow mm -hmm. alum. Oh, yeah, EY alum. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ken. And Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Gus. Thanks, Nadia. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Nadia. <laughs>